Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Talk Math with Your Friends. Our speaker today is Dr. Adriana Salerno of Bates College and Dana Suff. Today, she'll be talking to us about origami in higher dimensions. So can anyone please join me in welcoming Dr. Salerno? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Thursday, I, I like many of you said right before we started, uh, officially started, I also have been unable to come to a lot of these because of mostly my my day job is now an actually now nine to five job. And so it's hard to get away. Um, I can get away when it's me that's giving the talk, but uh, rest of the time has been hard. So it's very exciting to be here. Um, I, I'm gonna try to be here more often, but we'll see. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about a project um, that I've been doing for a couple of years. Um, and it's about this idea called origami constructions. So I'll walk you through what we've been working on. Uh, one of my collaborators is here, Sarah Chari. And so I, I, have, I have invited her to be another featured friend since you know, she can actually answer some of the questions that y'all might have. And so, um, uh, okay, oh, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm clearly wearing green in honor of, um, so, There's a green um, rectangle around you. The, uh, oh, okay, good, good, good. The the yeah, the shared screen also is is green, right? So um, all right. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project. And so, in general, um, origami is the art of folding paper. Uh, there's actually a large amount of research now on how to apply origami to like engineering and other things. Um, and then there's also been sort of scientists who have been studying how to make origami um, better or something. So, so Robert Lang, for example, is a physicist by training, but he has like spent a lot of time figuring out how to sort of um, systematize the design of origami. So uh, you can go to his webpage. It's fascinating. It has all this beautiful art on it. But then he also has like sort of um, made all these folding patterns that sort of show you how intricate this can be. And he actually can design these things using science-y things. I'm actually really not, like I can barely make like one of those like little, you know, guessing things that you did in grade school. That's about as, as far as my folding skills go. But, um, but I've always been fascinated by this and, and the idea that you can do, yeah, yeah, that one. The one that you're like is sort of uh, randomizing some, some choice. Um, okay, so, but what uh, the key feature here is that there's a way in which we are making this folded, beautiful rhinoceros from just a pattern of lines and intersections of lines on this piece of paper. So somehow this sort of two dimensional design is turning into this fascinating thing. Um, and here's another one. This is one of my former students. Uh, she graduated last year. And, um, and this is, so, so she, she worked on this stuff for a little while with me on a summer research project. And this was her sort of like, here are some steps in which you're making origami, right? Like you're folding the piece of paper. And then in fact, that like sort of those Diagonal folds give you this middle point and then you can fold it in the middle. So it's giving you some reference points. Each intersection of these folds is giving you like, it's much easier to know, for example, where the half of that piece of paper is once you've done those two diagonals, right? Uh, than just guessing. Well, I guess you could guess, but um, anyway, the idea is we want to sort of mathematize this process. And so uh, here's my disclaimer for Kate and anyone who was excited about seeing some paper folding. There is no actual origami construction in this talk. Um, by actual, I mean like I'm not going to fold any. Well, OK, you can you can you are welcome, invited and encouraged to fold things uh, to your heart's content while I'm giving this talk. But um, what I'm going to talk about is sort of one way in which we can abstract a couple of these features of origami. And then once we do this abstraction, which is a very um, mathy thing to do, then we follow it through and try to figure out, well, what else can I say? What kinds of insights do I get? 
What kinds of patterns do I see? When is this nice? When is this not nice? This is like the biggest math question of all is like, is this pretty? Is this not pretty? Is this messy? These are exactly the things that I'm gonna talk about. And so um, the setup is this, we're going to abstract our paper or, or make an abstraction of our paper. And we're gonna think of two dimensional space. Um, sometimes it'll be convenient for us to think of it as the complex numbers um, because that's two dimensional space with some algebra, with some arithmetic, right? So that is always really nice. But in general, for this talk in particular, we're gonna think about just, you know, having two dimensional space. Um, in origami, we start with the paper and then we fold it and we go, you know, we make something that's three dimensional out of this two dimensional thing. For now, we're gonna stick with two dimensional space, but we're going to start with some reference points, like the corners of that piece of paper for the crane. Um, let's think of, we, we wanna start with some reference for what our first folds are gonna be. And then uh, we're going to, um, this is the, sort of the weirdest abstraction because in origami you can fold in any which way, but here what we're gonna do is we're gonna restrict what types of folds we can make, okay? And by folds, I mean, we're gonna draw lines on the complex plane with certain prescribed angles, okay? So for example, I'm only allowed to do folds that are horizontal or vertical or angle zero or angle 90 degrees, right? So there's, there's gonna be some ways in which we're gonna just restrict this. And then um, we're gonna see what happens when we intersect those lines. So the origami construction, the, I'm skipping a few steps, but I'm gonna show you this through an example. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and magic happens. No, but I think that like the easiest thing is to show you an example. So I'll, I'll go through the example and then it'll make sense. But the idea is we make these folds, which means we draw these lines in two dimensional space and they're gonna intersect somewhere as long as they're not the same angle, right? And so they're gonna get intersect somewhere. And then those points we're going to throw into a big set. Okay, and then we're gonna do this iteratively until we can get no more points. Okay, so this is a way to construct a subset of the complex numbers by just taking lines and intersecting them and then, and then collecting those points, okay? Tiana had an interesting question, which is that yeah. when you're doing the paper, there's sort of two directions for the, for the fold as an orientation. I have some memory of being able to uh, reconstruct that. Is that gonna come up? So we're not gonna go, so there is another sort of way in which we can abstract origami. And this is like, people have used this to sort of, um, you can prove that you can trisect an angle with origami by using these, these sort of axioms that you would get from an origami fold. Um, but you cannot, that, that is not where, where we're going with this. We really are just like staying flat. There's no folding in the sense of like, we're not identifying any points. We're not sort of like orienting things in a new way. We really are just like flattening everything. And it's as if we did origami and then we unfolded the paper and then we looked at what was what were those lines on the paper, like the picture I showed you for the Robert Lang rhinoceros, right? So we really only care about like, after we did this origami, what's left on this piece of paper, okay? But there is a whole other area of like axiomatizing origami that leads to really cool things like trisecting an angle. And so, um, so it's, it is, there is, there is a whole other story there, yes. So this definition that I'm using is due to, um, and, and they're pictured in the order <laughs> their names come in, um, but Bueller, Butler, Delaney, and Graham. Um, and, uh, and in fact, they were, they worked on this inspired by a question from Eric Demain. And so Eric Demain is, is famous for doing sort of rec really deep, interesting recreational mathematics or, um, th this really understanding like the mathematics of games or the mathematics of origami and actually designing some cool sculptures with his dad, who's a sculptor. Anyway, so, so there, there is sort of like a, um, inspiration from people who do actual origami is what, what it, where I'll leave that. Um, and they wrote a paper that's like the, the start of all this um, story 
But I really want to show you um, in a picture. So this is where I use my Apple Pencil, which I hope is working today. Um, we will go through an example carefully. And so uh, I will be asking you to sort of make guesses in the chat uh, as to what is going to happen. Okay, so this is this is where where I want you to be involved. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw lines with these angles. And so one of the things that happens in this story, let's do red, um, is that we could um, express these angles in many different ways. I have chosen to express them as elements of the unit circle in the complex numbers. That sort of makes it a little bit simpler. Um, I, there, there are many things I could have done. I could have also said like zero degrees, 45 degrees and 90 degrees, or I could have done in radians, so zero, pi over four, pi over two. Uh, I'm choosing the, um, the sort of complex number notation because it is really convenient, and especially in two dimensions, okay? Um, but I may change this notation and <laughs> please let me know if it gets confusing because like, I and my collaborators have gotten very used to just like going back and forth between points and angles. And it, I, we understand that it's not like, <laughs> they're not the same thing, but to us, they are in this situation. And so what is this saying? We are going to make an origami construction. Uh, we're gonna start with the points zero and one. So those are our starting points. And then we're gonna iterate a process. What process is this? Well, the process is we draw all of the lines with these, only these angles through those points that we have available, and then we see where they intersect. Okay, so the first one would be something like this. That is almost 45 degrees. Um, and then um, the horizontal line is not gonna give us any new points because it's going through zero and one. The vertical line is also kind of boring, but we can do a vertical line through one, and we get a new intersection point right there. Um, what point is that? One, one. One, one, or one plus i, whatever yeah. you would like to call it, right? And then uh, are there any other things that we could do? What's another thing we could do? I'm not sure. Uh, what I'm seeing from people is, does 45 mean exactly in the, that direction or 45 from something else? It is, um, it is, and it uh, only means an angle. Oh, so, so all of the parallel lines with that angle are allowable. Okay, it doesn't, it, so, so you need a, a, a slope and a point, right? And so this is telling you the slope. And then, and then the points are given by our seed points, right? So you could also do a 45 degree line, but coming out of one instead. Mm -hmm. Right. Th does that answer your question? I was going. Could you go? Could you go up left from one? You by taking a forty-five degree angle away from ah, the left. No, no. It really does mean um, this, uh, like in the direction of one plus okay. i. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. So we're not. We're we're really only doing that one angle. But that, that does matter, right? So we got one more intersection point, right? And so then what the origami construction tells us is like then we just add those two points. We add one plus i and we add negative i, right? Or one, one and zero negative. Uh, yeah, zero negative one. Yeah, okay. And so then uh, now, now we start with those points. And so the next step in our iterative process is now we have four points and we do the same game on all of those points, right? So we could draw horizontal lines here. We could draw vertical lines. Uh, we could draw like 45 degree lines. And, um, and then we get uh, six, I mean, four more points. We get this one, this one, this one, and this one, okay? 
And we don't get any more from this generation, but we added four more. Which points did we add? I should open the chat because I'm not seeing anything. I see negative one minus I. Uh, oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Clear the math <laughs> notification. <laughs> I just saw that. Um, so, sorry, what? Negative one plus, uh, negative one minus I. Negative one minus I. I, one minus I, uh, and I think two plus I, I'm not sure. And two plus I. What are you noticing? What do you expect is gonna happen in the next few steps? What patterns do you notice? Drew asks if we're translating. Ah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry if there's a little lag with the drawing. Um, uh, do you see it okay now? Yes, I think so. Okay. So um, are we just translating? Yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, like you are, uh, there, there is a process that seems like translating, especially because we're, we chose these angles, right? So they're like really, you know, we're moving this like, 45 degree line over and round. Um, and so um, what else do you notice? And so here are the, oh, there is a lag. What's going on? I just, uh, there you go. So, um, so those are the points that we have now. Um, we could do another step. And, and what you'll see is this, it just sort of grows. It grows in this weird way. Oh my gosh, why is it not? Yep, there is a lag. All right, not sure what to do about that. But um, there's, there's more points. So um, what is something else that you notice? So Drew noticed that we're translating and yeah, we're doing that because it's like we're, we're adding more points and then we're drawing the same lines. Well, there's not much going on with these lines. It's just you're going vertically, you're going horizontally, and you're going diagonally, and only in one way diagonally. Like BK said, it's not we're not allowing this angle. We're allowing this angle, right? And so, um, so what do you notice about the points? Like, and so, so the idea is the idea of the origami construction is this, and like that. I didn't explain it so well before or so clearly before because I don't think that it makes sense until you draw a picture. But um, when you do draw the picture, um, you start seeing that what you're gonna do is you're gonna iterate this forever. And then eventually, eventually after forever, you have a subset of the complex numbers. It's clearly infinite, but um, but there's going to be a point where you're not going to be able to add more points, okay? Or, or what you can think of is, is this, this um, well, no, there's always more points because it's an infinite process. But the, this is an infinite union of these sets, okay? So um, in, in, in this situation, it looks like we're going to get, well, that it's discrete sets and that it's the, like it's thought of as an integer lattice. Mm-hmm. So you keep going and going, and what you get is called the Gaussian integers. So it's so nice, it's named after Gauss. Um, so, uh, oh, there, there we are. And now there's gonna be an underline. Okay, so <laughs> I've been, there is a lag for sure. Um, so uh, the Gaussian integers, so all of the integer combinations of, you know, complex numbers. And so, uh, so all the numbers of the form like a plus bi where a and b are integers, okay? And so what, mathematically speaking, so we did this iterative process and we got like me basically the nicest thing you can get, right? This is extremely organized, very clear, very discrete. It's a lattice is what we call this lattice. Um, one, one day you'll see me writing lattice, but that I wrote it. Um, it's a, um, it's a very, very nice set. So like I said at the beginning, 
we're going to concern ourselves with when are things nice and this is as like the you know quintessential nice set okay and so um another thing that you might notice is um that and this is one situation in which it was helpful to think of these as complex numbers and not just a subset of the plane is that this is not just a subset of the complex numbers it's a sub ring so if this is something that is interesting to you this also has arithmetic properties that um is that that makes it like especially nice, right? It's not just a subset. It's a subset with more structure than most. Okay. And so then this is the question. And this is the question that Euler Butler et al. Uh, were investigating is like, when do these constructions lead to nice subsets of the complex numbers? And so um, and so I had students uh, a few summers ago, I just like try to, this is very algorithmic, right? This is an iterative process. So you can tell the students to put it into a computer and see what they get, right? And so, so they experimented a lot and like they, they had different starting angle sets and they drew pictures. Um, one of the challenges of this is that there's like basically a combinatorial explosion because like every time you have these points, then you have to draw all of the lines through those points and see where they intersect. And so, um, yes, and they do look like stars. And in part, it's because like the way that you're constructing them, you're sort of like bursting from from the point zero one outwards. Right. And this is this is just the nature of how you construct it. Of course, it's not limited to that is that my students. Or, or our computing skills were limited to computing only certain amounts of points until the computer crashed. And so um, if anybody knows how to, or has students that would love to, uh, you know, program this, that, 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 would be, that would be a fun project because this is a challenging coding product, project. So some things that you notice, what do you notice? What do you wonder about these pictures? So this is where we start trying to find patterns, right? Before this slide came up, I was ex I was thinking of trying to write down something with uh, pi over three or maybe pi over six to see if I got a hexagonal or equilateral triangle sort of tessellation. Um, and it looks like you were trying things where written as angles, you'd expect them to have like, Sort of like common factors, right? They, in terms of what fraction of the whole they are, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that does not appear to predict really cleanly which ones are discrete and which ones are not, which is surprising mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. So yes, and I will um, say that the reason that we were um, so so yes, so so you can tell that some of these are nice and organized and some of these are not. So this is sort of like, this is great. We like this one, right? The one on the top left. The other ones are a little messy. And and like BK said, it's it's not a matter of like, um, of like denominators exactly. And one reason that we tried these is that the big theorem from the Butler et al or Bueller et al paper was that um, if these points or these angles form a subgroup of the unit circle group, then you get a ring. Okay, so so, so there is a, there is a theorem that says when are you going to inherit the the ring properties of the complex numbers in your origami construction? And so we started with things that were that were rings in the sense of like these these sort of you know, are you have you have the identity, you have the like inverse for every one of these as subsets of the unit circle, right? And so you have to think of this this multiplication operation uh, of of ec, like e to the whatever, right? So I'm I and I know you didn't say if and only if, but so it's not an if first, and only if, right? Because in your first example, we didn't have three pi or uh -huh. whatever. It is. Three okay. pi over two. Uh huh. Yeah. So okay. it's not an if and only if. And I had one other student work on sort of when do you have um, certain types of rings. And so he actually looked at rings of integers of 
imaginary quadratic fields as like an example. And he proved that those could all be constructed by origami and they were not always, um, the, the angles didn't always form a group. So yes, it is, it is the, the converse is not true, right? And so, um, but that's why we started with these because we knew it has like nice arithmetic properties. One takeaway of that is that nice arithmetic properties and nice geometric or topological properties are not always going to happen at the same time. So that's a surprising thing for, it was for us. And so, um, so one of the things that you might wonder is, you know, when do you get these messy things? And then here the students were like, well, this is a mess, can I zoom in? And then it was still a mess, but not so much of a mess. <laughs> it's just so confusing to be talking and only see the, my pictures show up. So I'll, it, it's good for me personally, because I tend to speak a little fast and this is actually forcing me to slow down a little bit. So it's all good. Um, and so then, um, and so then there's, there's a question here, which is a topological question, right? And it's a matter of, is this dense or is this discrete? In which case we wanna look at whether it's a lattice. So, so that is the question that we are, um, that we're thinking about. And so um, a, I know you probably all know this, but I'm gonna remind you what dense means in a second when this changes the slide. Okay, so a subset of another set is dense if every open neighborhood around any element of X contains an element of S. Okay, so informally, if you zoom in, um, if you zoom in to, the, to a certain point in the set, you will still get elements of the other dense set, right? So zooming in doesn't make things simpler. In a lattice or in one of these discrete sets, if you zoom in conveniently around certain things, you will start missing points, right? And then you will only get points in your bigger set. And so here's the theorem from another theorem from Butler et al, is that anytime you have a set an angle set with more than three elements, you're gonna get a dense set. And those are exactly the examples we were seeing in the previous slide, is the only one that was discrete had exactly three angles. Any more than that will give us a dense set. And, uh, and any less than three gives us nothing interesting. It either gives us like the same two points or like maybe two more points, that's it. And so, um, so two angles is not enough. Three angles gives us a lattice, four angles or more gives us a mess, okay? So, uh, so it's not, there's not a lot of room to, to, do, to do much there. Well, and there um, are not a whole lot of three element subgroups of the so, unit circle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And so most of them are not gonna be a, uh, no, they might be a subring, but they're not gonna, it's not gonna be because of this theorem. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like the Gaussian integers came from three angles, but they were not. And so in fact, every time that you have three angles, you get a lattice. Okay. And, and Dmitry Nadrenko showed that. So, oh. and, um, and then, and what you get is something, you know, so you're going to get something like Z plus Omega Z, like something, some, some lattice. Sorry, I, I went back and see, I need to slow myself down. All right, so you're gonna get something that looks like this. And this is only a ring if, if this has certain special properties. Okay. So, so you need it to be closed under multiplication. And so it's only gonna happen for some of these omegas. And that really determines whether you get a ring or not. Okay, okay I'm gonna ask my question again because I'm confused about the answer. So if we take the angles uh, zero i, negative one, negative i, that has four elements in it. It's a subgroup of the circle. And so, and it clearly produces the a lattice. Yes, 
or no? Yes. But here is here is the oh, here is the problem is that um, we are doing this modulo the negative of the points, right? Because the angle is the same. The angle that goes through zero is the same angle that goes through negative one. It's a horizontal line. Sure. So we don't count those as different. Oh, okay. Great. So we're taking, we're really taking the circle mod plus or minus one. And so when I talk about a subgroup, I do mean a subgroup of the circle mod plus or minus one. There you go. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, there is a question here. Uh, very cold and wax. Yeah, I like that. Can we use this to show that some rings of number of fields cannot arise? Yes. So, um, so you can get, uh, yeah. So, so for cyclotomic fields uh, or cyclotomic integer sets, um, you get them if it's a p root of unity where p is a prime. And then if it's not, you get other stuff. And so you can't get that exact cyclotomic set. This is, that's all in, in, the, in the Butler, Bueller et al paper. So it's a really fun paper. And, and they really went like very deeply into several things. Um, I wanna, you know, I don't have a ton of time, but uh, I wanted to tell you about the stuff that we've been working on. And that by we, I mean Davina, who's also here and Sarah. Um, so uh, Davina graduated in 2020 um, and Sarah uh, graduated a little bit before that, but they were both my students at Bates. Sarah is now a professor at Bates. And so, um, so full circle. Uh, and um, and so then um, we actually wanted to see what happened if we went beyond two dimensions. Now, this is going to be really confusing. And in fact, it's getting farther and farther away from origami. The more math we do, the less it is about. So this, now I call this math inspired by origami. But it is there is no, no application to like a three-dimensional version of origami or a four-dimensional version of origami. Um, and so, um, so then, but, but we are really like um, generalizing in the, in the simplest ways possible. And so the first thing we're going to do is instead of two-dimensional space, we're going to have n-dimensional space. And, um, and we're going to have points on that space. And we're going to have angles that are, oh my gosh, now it's really annoying that it's not updating. Hello. Points in the space. And we're going to have angles that are, um, are represented by, by vectors in this vector space. Okay. And so again, I mean, this is this is one place where the thinking of these as vectors is useful because they have a um, magnitude that we do not care about at all, but they have a direction, and that's the part where we'll care about for our angles, right? This is just this is the part, the aspect that we care about. And so, um, and then we can always define a, lane, a, a line through a point with an angle by this, you know, p plus r alpha, where r ranges through the reals. And so that's just going to be a line going through a point with a certain direction. Um, and then um, and then we can do that for any point and any angle, right? And so the 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 upshot is that we can define um, our intersection like we did in two dimensions. Um, and we're going to do this like this. So we're going to have a point P and a point Q, an angle alpha, an angle beta, and then we can define our intersections like we did before. Okay. And so then, oh. And so then uh, the intersection of the two lines is the point. Um, denoted uh, by this symbol, P, Q, bracket, alpha, beta. Okay, so this means 
the line with angle alpha through P intersected the line with angle beta through point Q. Okay, this is symmetric if you swap the P and the alpha, but not if not if you only swap one pair, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about that. And the other thing you have to be careful about that now is that since we're not in two dimensions, two lines won't, won't always intersect, right? And so you could get this, right? <laughs> and so, um, so then sometimes if they don't intersect, we'll just say the intersection is empty and we'll denote it by the empty set. Okay, so it's either a point or it's empty. Okay, um, uh, that, that says if they don't empty. All right, <laughs> and so uh, and so then uh, and so then we can define the origami set like we did before, and so we can um, just uh, have a set of distinct angles represented by elements in R n, <laughs> um, and we start with the seed points zero and one as usual, and then we have um, our uh, iterative process. And so we can actually do this more formally. So we can define a set called M1, which is all the intersections, but only with the points zero and one, right? So that's the, what we call, my students would call the first generation of this iterative process. And then for every K greater than zero, um, greater than one, we can define the same thing, but then we take the points in the, in the intersection PQ, from the previous generation, right? And so then this is a this is the same thing that I described uh, before. And so then the origami set is the union of this collection of sets. Okay. Two and technical so, questions. Yes. What is one? Is it the the one 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 vector or the one zero zero? Ah uh, yes. No, I should have I should have said that. Um, we are we're still gonna. I mean, you don't have to um, be. Oh my God, so many NSF emails. <laughs> this is what I mean by one. Um, by one, I mean equals um, the the vector one zero 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 zero. And then okay? for that I mean, definition, you just want to you just want to identify two points. It could be any two points, just like in the plane. And so we just arbitrarily pick this um but it could be any two points just like on the on the 2d version it could have been any two points in the 2d version the picking zero and one was convenient for getting the ring properties though so it's not totally arbitrary and in this case we will see there's there's a version in which what we're picking here is going to be we're going to try as much as we can to generalize the 2d situation um, even the, the ring structure. So anyway. And just to make sure I understand in that MK plus one, I expected it to be P and Q that are in the MK, not alpha and beta. Yes, you are okay. right. Um, I, it, it's just a typo. I think it's got uh, that. Alpha, yeah. beta are in U and P and Q are in MKU. Okay, perfect. So the idea okay. is that the alpha and beta are still in only in that angle U, and then the P's and Q's are taken from the previous generation. Yeah. So that's that's what it should say. Yes, thank you. Um, so moving on, I'm going to do a uh, example in 3D just so that you can see what this looks like. That's the only example I can do. Um, because we are uh, we are limited <laughs> in our capacity to see anymore. Yes, yes. There's going to be a lot of that, and so um, so then I I do mean now the point like the origin for zero and one is just one zero 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 zero, and in a way I'm going to abuse notation quite a bit. So I'm going to be calling i to be zero one zero to be the sort of generalization of our complex i and j is going to be zero zero one and in part what you'll see is that this is a really natural really lovely generalization to quaternions and i'm going to show you that later but um 
But for now, this is what we mean. And so then you can just uh, draw these pictures and you can see like two of these intersections. So going through zero and one with angles um, I and I plus one, you get negative I. Um, and, uh, and then for through zero, one, uh, J plus one J, you get J plus one. And so um, you get this one. And so, so you can see, or J minus one, this should be I minus one and J minus one. Oh, well, um, it doesn't matter too much because <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's gonna be the generalization of our Gaussian integers except that we do not have the algebra that we would like, but it does look the same. And so in this situation, what we're gonna get is a lattice that is closed under addition, but not under multiplication, okay? And so, um, and so we get this really, really nice thing. And so the question that we've been asking is when do we get a lattice? When do we get something that's like sort of nicely evenly distributed, nicely symmetric in uh, higher dimensions? And so we want to understand the structure of um, our set in n dimensions. And so I'm just going to go through these. Um, so we want to understand the structure of the set. When is it closed under addition? Um, when is it closed under multiplication is an interesting question, but we don't have too much to work with yet. Um, when is it dense and when is it discrete? And what we really, really want to focus on is when is it closed under addition and not dense, in which case we call, we think it's, we say it's a lattice. And just to remind you what a lattice is, um, and we call this a full lattice because you could have lattice there's a definition of lattice that allows it to not have the same dimension as the ambient space. But what we mean here is a n dimensional subset or subspace of Rn um, where uh, that is generated by a, a basis of Rn, but it has um, integer, all the integer linear combinations of the basis. Okay, that's what we mean by a lattice. And so this is what it looks like. It's going to be closed during the addition. It has a nice symmetric structure. I have to wait for the slides. Um, it's, it's closed under addition. It has a nice symmetric structure. And our origami set will either be one or not. It's, it's not, there's no question about that. And, um, and you can also um, talk about lattices being contained in other lattices. So we, when we say, so you can get like, you know, a more sparse cloud of dots or a denser cloud of dots. Dense, not, denser is not the right word or more dots. Um, and then one will be maybe contained in the other. And then we call the sort of the one with more dots, more used loosely um, is the finer lattice. In a way, you have like a finer mesh, right? So, um, and so then, uh, so then we get to the theorems. Of Fifteen minutes to spare. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, here's here's our first result. Da da da. All right. So the first thing we showed is that um, any lattice can be constructed through this method, and it's actually not that complicated to see. So we can choose our angles carefully and we construct any lattice in n dimensions with this process. Um, and sort of this comes down to this idea of the intersection really being like, can we find a solution to the equation, this line equals this line, right? Just like I said here. And you can always find a solution if you pick the angles to be basically the point that you want. Okay, because from zero one, you can get, um, come on, from, from zero one, you can, if you pick the, the angles tau and tau minus one, in our paper, we're more careful. And so we, we chose everything to be sort of normalized to be on the unit sphere. Here, I'm just, I mean, it's the same direction, right? So it doesn't matter too much. But um, I just didn't want to have norms everywhere. So, um, 
So you can actually sort of build every point basically from zero one or build your, um, your basis. And then once you build your basis, you get all of the other points. Um, this is actually more careful than that, but <laughs> this, is, this is the general idea is that you can, once you create, once you generate your basis, that's, you'll, you'll get your lattice. Um, and so, uh, oh, that's just a general pause. And so, um, more things that we were able to show. Hello. Um, if you get a lattice from the construction, your angle set has to contain at least two n minus one angles. And so, this generalizes our, our two dimensional version needed three angles, right? And so, um, and, and our, for the 3D example that I showed you, we needed five angles, et cetera. So, so we, we can show this. Um, and in the same way that when you have four angles on a plane in the 2D, in the, in the two-dimensional version, anytime you had four angles, you got something dense. What happens here, and this is something that, that Drew mentioned earlier, is that anything that you see just propagates, right? Like it gets translated. And so the same thing, if, if it's dense on one plane, it's gonna be dense everywhere. And so if you have four angles on one plane, you get a dense set no matter where you are, right? Um, and then uh, if you have um, a, if you can construct a lattice from a set of angles, then you might wonder what happens if I add another angle to this set, right? So in two dimensions, if we had three and we added one more, we no longer had a lattice. But now we have a lot more room to, to get things to be different, right? For example, that they don't always have to intersect when you have two lines. And so, um, and so one of the following things can happen. You either get a finer lattice, human said, Side. All right, you get a finer lattice, meaning that you maybe by adding another angle just made things cluster a little more, but it doesn't get dense. But it could get a dense set if you cluster enough. And it could happen that you add another angle and you, nothing happens. You get the exact same origami set. And so, um, so I just wanted to close with a couple of examples. Um, so here are, uh, here's an example in three dimensions. And so um, in three dimensions, remember, we need at least two n minus one angles. And so we can just pick the simpler ones, the simplest ones, and we get this, um, uh, the, the sort of 3D Gaussian integers, sort of. Um, and then let's say we add this. Um, this is, looks really funky, but the idea is, and this is a picture that Davina did on Tixi. I'm like impressed with this, <laughs> but you will be in a second. Okay, um, is that what you do is you can create now, like, so remember that when we were doing these origami constructions, everything was propagating outwards. And the issue is that once you start propagating inwards in a specific way, then you start propagating inwards as much as you want. And so what you're gonna get is a dense set, okay? And so this case, uh, this is a case where basically what happens is you, once you can do that, you can imagine that now you have, instead of the starting points being zero and one, the starting points being zero and one third. And so then you can just create uh, another little box in here, right? I mean, that's exactly the same mic the microcosm of the, your original cube. But then if you can do that, no, there it is. If you can do that, then you can do it again because you can do, do a third of that third. And so what you do is you get some like box, uh, uh, like a sequence of, of cubes converging to zero, right? But that doesn't ever become zero. And so then you get a dense set. And then, uh, and then I also wanted to show you about the quaternion example. Um, and so, so quaternions are a really nice situation. And in fact, they are, they were conceived as a generalization of the Gaussian integers. Like this is what 
Hamilton wanted to do. And so um, uh, it's, it's a really nice um, sort of example of this. And so if you pick basically the, you know, one I, one minus, I minus one, and now the I's and the K's and the J's do mean the quaternion ones, which are, you know, essentially the one, zero, 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 et cetera. But um, and then you get what we call, a, so you get a lattice inside the Hamilton quaternion algebra that has a special name. It's called the Lipschitz order. And it's, uh, and it's as nice as it can get, except um, there's a, a slightly nicer one called the Hurwitz order that people like better because it's maximal. So you can't fit anything into it and it fits into the Lipschitz order. And so this is an example of how you could get a finer lattice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and here's the best part about the quaternions is that you can actually um, now use a formula like with the complex numbers where you can actually multiply and you don't have to sort of solve equations. You can just do algebra and arithmetic to find the intersections. And so that's really nice too. Um, and I'll just skip this one, but that's, this is a, a table of intersections. Um, you'll see a glimpse of it. I wanted to wrap up with the irrelevant angles, which means that like we can add an angle, see, and there's a bunch of empty intersections. So you can add an angle and nothing happens. So for example, like just like we were doing before, we can get these sort of 3D Gaussian example. And so one way that we've been thinking about this is you can think of, so if you take a lattice and you project it onto the unit sphere, basically you're taking this sort of like nice countable set and projecting it onto the unit sphere. And then say you project also the like connections between these points. What you're gonna get is a mesh on this sphere. It doesn't cover all of the sphere. So say that you have like, you know, this mesh and you have all these arcs here. And so these are the points on the lattice and these are the points going through them. It's gonna be messier than the lattice itself was, but not a lot. And so you can pick any point that's not on there, that is not going to intersect with any of the other things that you had. So what's going to happen is you're going to get infinitely many choices of angles that you could add into your, into your, um, into your set, your angle set, that are not going to change the origami construction. Just because you have more room. I, what? I missed that one. Oh, okay. That well, seems like if you add the blue idea, one so. in, it seems like if you add the blue one in, you'd get a bigger lattice rather than the same lattice. So it can't intersect with any of the other ones um, because. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, because you took all of the intersections and you you projected it down. And yeah. so there's no way that it could have intersected. I keep thinking of it as I, there's a lot of connections to like integer span of vectors. And I keep yeah. thinking about it that way. And that's not what's happening here. No, we're actually drawing lines and intersecting. And so like, yeah, so. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, but that, that is that is exactly what happens to us when we're thinking about this and trying to write it up. Um, there's there's other ways to think about this. Think of this as being you're solving two algebraic equations, uh, one which is like you know with, both with integer coefficients, right? So there's like the lattice, which is a sort of integer lattice, and uh, and then you have this like equation of the unit sphere. And so there's, if you just pick something really um, transcendental for your vectors, or for your, for, your, um, for your entries of the vector, there's, it's, it's very unlikely that you can solve that using these equations. 
um, we're still working on this proof. So <laughs> I'm just saying that like, we're still <laughs> finalizing the details, but it's kind of fun that there's something that, um, that we're working on. Um, you can also think about the ring structure. And so we have not done this in n dimensions and it's been done um, sort of to completion uh, in two dimensions. <laughs> and so when you search origami rings on the interwebs, you find lots of really cool uh, things, but this Don't is search I mean. that other phrase on the internet. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you research origami rings, um, you you get uh, this, but what we really mean is that you can you construct a subring of n-dimensional space. And so, for example, yes, like the quaternions are an example of this, right? That you do get like an algebraic structure, um, and it's completely independent of whether it's dense or not. And Muller um, completely solved this for two dimensions. And he has a beautiful paper on like with. A really, you know, one of these huge theorems where like the following are equivalent and it's like 16 things that tell you if it's a ring or not. And it, it like sort of subsumes everything that other people did before, including Bueller et al. Um, our question is, can we do this in higher dimensions? We don't know. One thing that Davina thought about for her thesis was um, a, a different type of generalization, which is, can we do this in hyperbolic space? We did not get very far on that. It was very hard. Um, but there's there's lots of ways in which you can think about this. Anyway, so thank you so much um, for coming. And uh, soon you will see a slide that says thank you. Ah, there you go. <laughs> and, um, and another uh, picture from uh, Robert Lang's uh, webpage and, um, and a link to the archives paper that Davina and Sarah and I wrote. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, would you mind putting that archive link in the chat? We can't do not copy mind. it directly. Thank you. Um, well, we're about out of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna steal the share so that I can announce. Yes. Two weeks from now, I hope everyone comes back in two weeks. We've got Luke Seaton, Vanessa Sun, and Lee Trent from uh, our fam uh, online undergraduate resource fair for the advancement and alliance of marginalized mathematicians and you can check out our the rest of our spring schedule on our website and uh yeah please join me one more time in thanking dr adriana salerno a wonderful mathematician and my friend for this session today thank you Wait, i'm trying to cut, copy and paste the thing here it is